Hey everybody, welcome to Chatbox, I'm David Cruz. We are just a few days away from Governor Murphy's annual budget address. That's always pins and needles time for some school districts. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later on in the show, but we begin today with the pressures facing our environment, political, economic, and human. DEP Commissioner Sean LaTourette has been in the middle of it all lately, and he joins us now. Commissioner, good to see you again. Welcome to the show. Good to see you as well, David. Thanks for having me. So, all right, top of the list of things that I want to talk about uh, uh, is the latest on Liberty State Park and the plan there. Uh, you have a hearing coming up in March uh, on what's happening next there. Uh, that's a rescheduled meeting from one that was set for a few weeks ago. Uh, and just this week, we saw again Bob Hurley, the former basketball coach, pressing an agenda for a major sports facility at the park and pushing the misinformation about a plan to, and I'm using air quotes here, flood the park. It looks like opponents of your plan are out there, Commissioner, and they have a billionaire financing them. So, uh, first of all, uh, I, I have to say that Liberty State Park is, as many know, the crown gem of our state park service, but it's a rough cut gem. It's one that we have to invest in to better fashion and to shine for the benefit of all of New Jersey's residents for the 5 million visitors that we host every year and for the communities that we serve, including the host community here in Jersey yeah. City. There's nothing more important to me uh, than deep community engagement so that we can make sure that in this endeavor and others, we are being directly responsive to the needs of the community that we serve. Uh, and in this instance, that's the community here in Jersey City where I stand today. I'm at my Jersey City office in Liberty State Park, in the ah. historic railroad terminal uh, that we will improve for the benefit uh, of the state. Uh, we have to be mindful, of course, of, of some of the issues that uh, Coach Hurley and others are, are pointing out about the lack of uh, adequate recreational capacity uh, in the city of Jersey City, we have the ability here at Liberty State Park to help solve for some of that. But we also have to be honest, deeply honest, that we cannot solve the needs of this open space constrained city, this open space constrained county just here at Liberty State Park. Uh, that's why we've, through the Murphy administration, invested so much in providing more capacity to local uh, parks development programs, city-led, school board-led, to also help those organizations improve recreational spaces. You we'll know, do a good amount of added space here. It's uh, also- It won't be everything. It's also an expansion really kind of, of the mission of state parks, right? In, in Jersey City, you're going to be providing more recreational um, access and facilities than probably any other state park. These parks are generally nature preserves. So I want you to, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, touching a little bit on this question about flooding the interior of the park, uh, because that really touches on a lot of things, including environmental justice, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But talk about what, what flooding the park really means. Well, first of all, no one is going to flood. There uh, ain't no State flooding. Park. No, there, well, there is flooding in Jersey City. There is flooding in Liberty State Park. Uh, there is flooding in the communi in yeah. the Communipaw community that is just uh, west of Liberty State Park. Mm -hmm. uh, what we will do in uh, the very first phase of our revitalization program is to deploy a nature-based flood resilience project that will provide relief from flooding, not cause flooding. Look, it's clear that misinformation about this plan is being circulated. I don't want to speculate uh, about by whom or for what ends, but the reality is that the DEP, which is the state's flood engineering expert, we deploy flood resilience solutions all across New Jersey in coastal and in riverine communities we would never undertake an action that would cause flooding uh, in this park or elsewhere. Uh, what we will do is engineer with nature and create 
a flood resistance nature-based infrastructure project at the heart of Liberty State Park. And that project uh, during dry periods will also be inviting to the public, providing recreational opportunities, trails and running paths and, and opportunities to engage with nature. Uh, but no, no flooding will be caused. That is, uh, to be clear, a, a point of miss or disinformation. Yeah, and the idea, uh, not to sound like a spokesperson for the DEP, but the idea is that um, creating these wetlands inside the park helps uh, get the water to go somewhere other than Monitor Street, uh, just west of, of the park. So, uh, you know, I just want to say that because I know it's obvious that this is a personal thing with me. So I'll, you know, full exclude, uh, full uh, disclosure on that one. But all right. I, uh, I appreciate that, David. Let's just be clear about one thing, though. Yeah. Uh, what we will create here is uh, over 160 acres of a nature-based flood, uh, flood resilience solution that uh, is not standing open water. There's only roughly seven acres of standing open water in this design, but it does provide an outlet, a place for water to go. With the, with the pace and the density of development in this area of the state, we have not provided enough places for the water to yeah. go. Yeah. All right. Uh, more to come on Liberty State Park in, in the weeks ahead as well. Uh, a lot of talk in recent weeks also about the problems with the Newark lead water pipe abatement project. A lot of money went into that. Uh, now we learned that an audit found that some contractors had what missed some lead components. What is up with that? I mean, that's got to give a lot of towns across the state pause. I think that this is a, a reflection of the DEP, of the EPA, of the city of Newark doing its job to ensure that the work that was promised was done correctly uh, and that we ensure the complete removal of all lead components that that may remain. Uh, what's important to understand is that lead service lines can be complicated. Right? They're uh, a, a historic element of our older cities in yeah. particular. And so when a lead service line is, is replaced, it is certainly possible uh, that a component uh, may remain that is lead. That's why we continue uh, corrosion control treatment, notwithstanding the fact that lead service lines have been removed in the city of Newark and other cities uh, and towns all throughout New Jersey. But in the state of New Jersey, unlike under federal law, a partial lead service line replacement is not allowed. Our law requires a full lead service line replacement. And during this investigation, we found a few instances where some components were left on the street side, meaning so, between the curb and the water main. How, how big a problem is it? And how does it impact the water in Newark and assuage the fears of other communities that are gonna have to deal with this? So first and foremost, uh, this is not a cause for panic. Public health in the city of Newark is protected. Newarkers can have faith in the quality of the water coming through their taps. That's because since 2018, DEP in the city of Newark's water department has worked to optimize corrosion control. Because even after lead service lines are replaced, there may still be lead components in interior home plumbing or the use of lead-laden solder, particularly in Odin, uh, older homes. Yeah. And so corrosion control treatment provides continuing protection. That same protection would protect a resident if any lead component remained in their service line. That said, we've got to get them out anyway, and we'll be sure to do so. At this right. point, we don't think that this is a, a citywide problem, but we're further narrowing it down. And those who uh, may have acted incorrectly will be held fully accountable. All right. Staying in Newark, we saw the first lady who's running for Senate uh, come out against the Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission power plant in the Ironbound. That's been a few years brewing now, that whole controversy. When do we stick a fork into what a lot of people say is an unnecessary project? David, I think you know how deeply important uh, environmental justice is uh, to me. I worked tirelessly with Senator Troy Singleton and now Senator John McKeon uh, to craft and uh, pass the most empowering environmental justice law in the nation here in New Jersey. Uh, we're in the midst of a litigation uh, fighting those who would oppose that law uh, that are appealing uh, its rules uh, to the appellate court uh, in uh, the state of New Jersey. I believe we'll be successful there. Uh, so. 
environmental justice uh, remains a key priority for this administration. For, for me personally, I'm a professor of environmental justice at a Rutgers Law School. Uh, what's important to understand, of course, with respect to this particular instance is that there is only one entity that will decide whether or not uh, this project uh, would move forward. That entity is the Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission. The PBSC is, of course, not an instrumentality of state government. It is not a state-run yeah. water utility. It is a regional utility. And that the, the communities, the 48 municipalities that make up PBSC, they'll decide whether or not uh, they wish for the DEP to continue evaluating uh, the permit that has been put before uh, the DEP. Our evaluation of that is not yet complete. Uh, and while I certainly uh, respect uh, and admire the First Lady uh, and uh, respect her candidacy for, for, for the Senate, uh, what is important uh, that we understand is that this is a decision that is locally made. The 48 municipalities that comprise the PBSC district will decide whether or not they want this project uh, to continue. But one thing, there is one thing you can be absolutely certain of, is that I will apply if this permit application uh, continues to move forward. I will apply the, the spirit and the intent of the environmental justice law. That means any resulting permit cannot allow any disproportionate impact to fall upon uh, this already overburdened community. There must be mechanisms that are put in place should this proceed that would protect the public health and improve baseline conditions in this community. You can be assured that if this does proceed uh, further at the will of those 48 communities, that I will apply my maximum uh, environmental justice authority to this matter. All right, Commissioner Sean LaTourette, good to see you, man. Thanks for taking a few minutes uh, to be with us today. It's a pleasure as always. Thank you. As we said, budget season is always fraught for schools, especially those on the financial edge. Our next guest has made school funding a big part of his agenda. I thought he was on budget committee all this time, but it turns out he wasn't. He was just a big critic of the budget. Now he chairs the Senate Education Committee. It's a pleasure to welcome back to chat box, Vin Gopal. Senator, how you doing, man? Yeah, David, always good to be with you. So what is the big fight uh, uh, on education funding and who's winning and who's losing? Uh, well, look, on education funding, a lot of things have changed since the school funding formula came into law back in 2008, uh, SFRA. I mean, we, we've seen over the last six years that the funding formula just can't be based on uh, enrollment and property values. We've got mental health costs, transportation costs, special education costs. So uh, this is the last year of the school funding formula where you have winners and losers, and it needs a full revamping. And, I, and that's going to be a priority, I think, of the committee. And uh, I've spoken to Chairwoman Lampett on the assembly side, and I, I, I think she feels that there needs to be changes also. Uh, and that, that's my hope. So that's going to be something that uh, the legislature handles, right? Revamping the SFRA? Yeah, I mean, we're going to work uh, collaboratively. Uh, the acting education commissioner, Kevin Deemer, knows the uh, the formula in and out. He's one of the experts on it. Yeah. Um, so I think this is going to be good timing for us to all co come collectively together. The reality is a school district who's losing money now shouldn't be held accountable for decisions made by a school board and superintendent 15 years ago, whether they uh, spent money on a stadium or, or whatever they did at that time. How that should negatively impact kids now doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yeah, just as a, a matter of formality, how does that get changed, though? Is it a legislative process? Yeah, we're going to go through the legislative process. We're looking to have a hearing very soon, uh, bring stakeholders in. And I think the number one driving factor we got to look at is mental health costs. We've got 600 school districts that all tackle mental health differently. Um, and some have uh, social workers on site, others have third parties, others don't have anything. Um, so we have to look at all that. And, and one of the things that Senate President Sweeney really pushed for that didn't happen after he left and something that I want to carry forward is making sure the state uh, moves extraordinary special education funding 100 percent to the state. Um, a family should not be moving school district to school district, depending on the special ed programs of that district. Does the this is something that uh, Steve Sweeney, you mentioned him, uh, used to talk about a lot was uh, school regionalization. Uh, how much energy is there into that effort? 
It's there. I mean, we're seeing it. We just saw right here in Monmouth County. I worked uh, collaboratively with my colleague on the other side of the aisle, Senator O'Scanlan, uh, to regionalize schools in, in the Bayshore area. Um, it's there. Again, you know, it's the old saying about New Jersey is, is uh, home rule. Everybody loves the idea of consolidation. Yeah. Just don't do it in my backyard, right? And, right. Uh, it's a, Everybody hates Congress, but they always vote for their own congressperson. It's the same thing here. And I think um, that that's part of the challenge here is trying to understand that there are serious cost savings. And it's something that um, I think that the that the administration and the governor did focus on early on and something that I hope they, they look at again as they finish out their two years. So, I, you know, I think for people who don't have kids in, in school systems, this can become a little abstract. But... Um, what does it mean when a school uh, has gotten has taken unfair advantage of the formula, a, a winner, uh, and a, a school district that loses? What's what's yeah, the I difference? What does that mean? Yeah, I don't know if anybody is taking an unfair advantage. Uh, if they're gaining, right, probably bad choice gaining, of words, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, of course. If they're gaining funding, their enrollment's going through the roof. And I remember one of the first times I visited Freehold Borough when I became a state senator, they had. Uh, cardboard uh, cardboard boxes separating their classrooms because the enrollment was through the roof. They didn't have a library in the school. So I think, again, this is the challenge of having 600 individual school districts. And I think we're going to have a unique opportunity in 2024 to get this right. We're going to have one time. This is the end of SFRA. Uh, and SFRA needs a significant amount of changes. We can't have school districts losing uh, five, six, seven, eight million dollars, and they and they have to cut programs. And we know the worst thing that can happen is an increase in classroom sizes. So um, we have to get everyone on par, and everyone has to be uh, doing similar programs. And having uh, you know, you can't have one school that has extraordinary music and art program, and the other has absolutely nothing, and they're two miles away from each other. And that's one of the focuses I think our committees are going to look at this year. And there's a reliance, of course, always on local taxes. Uh, there was there's a bill. I, 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 I'm not sure what its status is, but that gives some municipalities the opportunity to exceed the local tax uh, rate. Explain that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, this is a bill uh, by Senators Wicker. It did pass on a bipartisan vote. So if your school district is losing funding and it's losing significantly um, and uh, the Board of Education for one year only wants to increase that cap, uh, um, and I, the, the residents that came, uh, I believe, was South Brunswick, um, uh, or South Plainfield, or South Brunswick, South Brunswick, and and they came to the committee, and there's probably about 30 or 40 parents there, um, and that's something they want. They they don't want to um, bless you. They don't want to lose that. So I think that's going to be um, something that uh, is there. But that's just a band aid. That's not a long term solution at all. So there's also um, uh, another bill that's out there that's aimed at um, abating the uh, learning loss that started um, during the pandemic and continues uh, to this day. Tell us where that is and where you stand on it. Yeah, Sen Senator uh, Ruiz has really championed this issue, and she is focused very hard on learning recovery issues. She has a literacy package she just put out. Um, look, we were hoping that high dosage tutoring would play a big role, uh, which was intense tutoring. Um, we put money in the budget. Unfortunately, the Department of Education just uh, only started rolling this out very, very recently. I want to say in December. It should have been rolled out way earlier than that. Um, uh, the governor spoke about it in his state of the state last February or, or, or last January, I'm sorry, um, and or in his budget last February. So th these are uh, there. We need to get moving. Uh, kids are behind in the state of New Jersey because of COVID, because of the lack of in-person education in math, reading, uh, writing in a number of areas. And, and we cannot lose this generation of kids because of uh, the COVID pandemic. And that's what's happening right now. So uh, I applaud Senator Ruiz and everything she's doing. She's leading on this. And uh, I'm hopeful that over the next 12 months, we can really, really put a chip in on combating uh, the learning loss challenges here in the state. You mentioned the budget address. It's coming up on Tuesday. What are you anticipating? Let me check that. What are you hoping to hear from the governor? A focus on NJ Transit. NJ Transit in this state, uh, I was very disappointed with the recent fare hikes. Um, and I, I want to make sure that there is some kind of sustainable funding long term for NJ Transit. Uh, we cannot ask. Uh, it's a re very regressive tax to ask riders uh, to 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 pay more and not get 
uh, better services. Uh, while we haven't had fare increases in seven years, that's understood, um, th it's still at the worst time to come. So I hope there's something in the budget as it focuses on NJ Transit and making it what it should be. What the governor said he was going to do back in 2018 uh, was fix NJ Transit if it killed him. So this is important. We have to get this uh, working. We have to create a bigger umbrella around NJ Transit so more people in the state are comfortable using it and ridership increases. Well, as you said, everybody likes talking about it, but nobody wants to do anything about it. What kind of... Uh source can can you suggest are you one of those who believes that the corporate business tax surcharge should be uh reinstated i don't i, I think everything should be on the table uh and i if, if uh corporate business tax itself uh, is very wide ranging and affects uh corporations of all sizes um, something more narrow or focused uh, at, at the very top uh, earners who have had show uh, uh, who've showed record profits. Uh, we've we've had a number of companies to do that. Uh, my one concern with the CBT broadly is that it it captures a lot of folks in that CBT tax, and you've got a lot of medium-sized businesses that are that are uh, trying to create a footprint here in the New in New Jersey and grow, and it could negatively impact them. But given the situation we're in and the circumstance we're in, I think you have to put everything on the table. The chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, said that he thought it might be a good idea to increase the sales tax in the state as a way of putting even more money into the pot for potentially funding NJ Transit. What do you think of that? I don't love uh, increasing regressive taxes. Those types of taxes affect working class families, the people that are most likely to be paycheck to paycheck, the people that are most likely uh, trying to make it work in a very expensive uh, climate with inflation. And I just, I'm not a fan of any type of regressive tax like that. Are we still debating book bans in New Jersey in 2024? That's a thing in your district, yeah? It's, I don't know if it's in my district, but it's definitely uh, in the state. And look, I, I try to give a, a well-meaning advice, and, and it's I shouldn't give it advice to the to, to the opposing political party. But they just had an election where they got wiped out because they focused on uh, transgender issues in schools and whales and dolphins dying, which they haven't talked about since November sixth. Um, and they lost by one of the largest landslides in a. Uh, in a midterm, uh, if the Republican Party wants to get taken seriously in the state, they should probably focus on taxes and affordability and, and issues that they used to be successful on. And on uh, my friends on my side, I'll say, why are you telling the Republicans this? Mm -hmm. Because it's not good for democracy. We have to bring people back to discussing issues. Um, we don't ban books here. Our books uh, in our libraries, we trust our librarians, we trust our school systems are age appropriate. And if there's a book in there, uh, that's not deemed that made it in there, they will go through the process of removing that book. This is not this is not new all of a sudden uh, in the last uh, one year or two years, but it makes me nervous based on history, based on every aspect of history, when you have any group of residents who are in the habit of pushing to ban books. It's not good. You mentioned political parties, and then we talked about this uh, last week. Um, Monmouth County was at the center of the political universe in the state a couple of weeks ago, um, and it turned out to be a good weekend for Andy Kim. Um, how is that race progressing, do you think, right now? Is Andy Kim the front runner? I mean, look, the polls have indicated that he's the front runner, and uh, I don't know if he is the front runner. I think... Uh, I think they're probably even. The First Lady enjoys a lot of establishment support in, yeah. in North Jersey. A number of those North Jersey chairs have, have come out for her. Uh, it seems like Andy Kim has a lot of, of grassroots support. I, uh, I've known both candidates for a while, and uh, they both have really strong skill sets. I think New Jersey is going to be in good shape no matter who they nominate. In June. St still a lot of race to go there. Also a lot of race to go for governor. Uh, real quick, Ras Baraka jumped into the race this week. You know him a little bit. What do you think of, of him as a candidate? Lip Roz has uh, done a great job in Newark. He's a, he's a great orator, great speaker. Uh, looking forward to seeing his platform. Uh, you know, I, I've met with him a couple times now and looking forward to seeing what he runs on and how that is going to directly uh, affect Monmouth County residents, because that's my focus. All right. Good stuff there. Senator Vin Gopal, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. And that's Chatbox for this week. Thanks also to Commissioner Sean LaTourette for joining us. You can follow me on X at David Cruz NJ and get more content, including full episodes, when you scan the QR code on your screen. 
I'm David Cruz. For all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight online at insidernj.com.